Hi, welcome to Oh God, off script film review. Andy, I'm distracted this week. <laughs> right again. Distracted. I'm distracted by I'm distracted by Overwatch 2. It came out today and I just almost said welcome to Overwatch. Welcome to Off Script. I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. Today on the show, we are talking about Don't Worry, Darling. The new Olivia Wilde film is out. Uh you, you, tri- what am I trying to say here? D- discourse and all, pre- weird press leading up to the film coming out and all, and we're going to talk about it. Uh, we're also going to take a look at Bros. Uh, the first big studio gay male-on-male rom-com is out, and it is underperformed at the box office. And Andy and I are here to explain it all. We're going to talk about a couple trailers, some exciting things coming up this week, uh, this month, this year that you want to see at the box office. Man, I really should have just restarted, I think. But I'm going I'm to power through it. Before we get to everything we need to talk about the news our first story this week i don't believe it andy hugh jackman is returning as wolverine for deadpool 3 i still think this is sensational right like there, there's no way there's no way what 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 is the story about i mean i i have a very different reaction from a lot of people i would have been really excited about this like 10 years ago but at this point in like the franchise and these people's career i was really hoping that uh disney w- would recast this character um, but let me let's get to the news. So there was going to be uh, a Deadpool three movie September 6th, 2024. So a couple of years from now. Uh, and Hugh Jackman will be, be reprising his role as Logan, the Wolverine, which he, even though he died a few mo- movies ago in, in Logan, which was allegedly his last time in a really great send off. Um, he's going to be coming back, which isn't really a big, big surprise. What's surprising for me is that Disney hasn't gotten on the ball and, recast and and made a new x-men movie uh yeah it seems like they're not going to do anything with that property till i think 2025 is what we were reading about a little while ago something about i I don't know figuring out the mcu and what they're going to do next there's clearly no mention of the x-men in any of phase five or as far as we know phase six which they never really fully announced at d23 this year um but it seems like they're not doing anything with it right now so this comes as a bit of a surprise the fact that deadpool 3 is happening i think is you know make, makes sense but it had been previously unannounced and the fact that wolverine is coming back for it is a bit of a surprise for sure fans of deadpool 2 may remember at the end of the last film there was a gag about deadpool traveling through time to go back to x-men origins a film uh, Ryan reynolds <laughs> was previously in uh to kill that version of deadpool goofy gag uh, use some stock footage from the original film. Uh, it was kind of neat. I don't know if they're going to pick that up and run with it or what the plan is, but we do know that this is not supposed to be like any kind of sequel to Logan. It's its own thing, right? This is going to be abstract Wolverine from the X-Men universe, we think. I mean, we don't We don't even really know. Yeah, that, uh, again, this is what I've kind of said uh, before in with this kind of a legacy property now. Um studios are really bad at handing off the baton to a new generation handing the reins. This is, you know, this is going to be <laughs> turning to Harrison Ford where Hugh Jackman is going to be playing Wolverine into his eighties, you know, <laughs> real danger of that. Uh, so we're going to see, but it is exciting news in, in some ways. I'm just disappointed that we're not getting the new X-Men movie that we're not getting a new, you know, hunky 30 something to, to play Wolverine um so that's just that's my my two cents not excited it's you know it's an interesting i think it's an interesting method for drumming up excitement about the film because they could have just said hey deadpool 3 is coming right ryan reynolds could have put a video on twitter whatever of him in the suit you know doing a gag maybe maybe do like a claw motif like maybe wolverine and then just save it for the for the theater right like that is not a move unbecoming of marvel and or or sony in the case of like spider-man no way home uh, and homecoming whatever the last spider-man movie was um you know they, they they will they will hold actors and not tell anybody they're in the movie until it comes out in theaters that's part of the excitement here they're not doing that they're just getting way out in front of it and saying nope he's gonna be in the movie everybody get excited it's gonna be great well, uh, not only enough. yeah not only that but every announcement i saw had basically had it in the title so even though there's this like minute and a half video that you can watch where it kind yeah. of like is surprisingly it's announced it's like everyone just spoiled it in the title so it didn't even yeah yeah i mean how how much would you if you had him show up at the end of some movie here people would have lost their minds yes 
Like I'm imagining a Infinity War level or Endgame level premiere. Like Portal opens up and Wolverine strolls out, people would have lost their minds in the theater, and it'll still be exciting. But I don't know. I don't know. More, more on this to come. I, I think it's a bit of a gimmick. I, I don't think he's going to be a big main character in the whole film. Maybe he will be. Maybe that's why they're announcing it now. I I, I have no idea. But stay tuned to keep it here on off script for more. Uh, our next story. Uh, there's new Planet of the Apes movie coming. Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes has been announced <laughs> uh, as beginning production next month. We have a couple of cast members. Um, Andy, what do you King- know about this? <laughs> it's it's a kind of an awkward title. I get what they're doing. They want to do something new, but also have the Planet of the Apes very you know famous thing. But it's like Kingdom of the Planet of the Country of the City of you know. But in come 2024, we're going to be getting a reboot of the Planet of the Apes Apes series. It will continue off the uh, kind of where the original, not the original, the previous trilogy uh, ended off. It's going to pick up about 10 years later. So somewhat be a completely new new thing. Uh, We don't uh, we don't know much more other than that. It's going to be directed by Wes Ball and star newcomers Owen Teague and Freya Allen. And uh, again, 2024 release. Very popular series and and well done by Matt Reeves of Batman fame. Or no, not, not Matt, not Rhett Reeves. Who did Doctor Sleep? Oh, it was God. that. It was that. Yeah, guy. you got I'm me on the wrong. spot. Uh, the same <laughs> guy who did Midnight Mass on that. Mike Flanagan did Doctor Sleep. Thank you. Um, right, it's good stuff, by the way. If you haven't watched it, uh, I don't know who did. Who am I? Thinking no, it was. Here? It was. It was Matt Reeves. I yeah. I found it. Yeah. Yeah, Matt Reeves is the Batman. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, who of course did the Batman and and the previous Planet of the Apes films. Um, So this this is I I, this was a good a good reboot that they did recently. Andy Serkis kind of made the uh, motion capture that stuff really uh, take off in that that series. So um, I'm excited about this. It's going to be a couple years away though. I really need to probably grow up a little bit with these movies. I think maybe I made it through the entire Planet of the Apes reboot with Andy Serkis and James Franco. And then I completely skipped the next two. Um, the, the pre- They're all <laughs> solid. The thinks, well, I'm not the only one who thinks the premise is like worse than Jurassic World. Like, <laughs> it's just so goofy. Like, oh, apes together strong. Like, I just don't care. It's like Fast and Furious level logic to me it's oh, like no. jurassic it's, world they hold up the I, other two movies hold up pretty well i think i know and they're matt Re- and i love the batman i love the batman i thought that was a super cool movie i've heard nothing but good things about them i have completely written them off in, in my head as intellectual drivel and i probably need to go back and and give these a shot um i caught a little bit of a very little bit of heat on twitter for saying they should abandon the planet of the n- nomenclature just call it kingdom of the apes for God's sake, is of the apes not enough of a moniker in the title, like to let people know that this is from the apes series? Do we really have to have Planet of the or in you, there? It, or a kingdom, pla- a, a Planet of the Apes story, like a Star Wars? Sure. Story. Yeah, right. Like, yeah, he, he, just Kingdom of the Apes, War of the Apes, Rise of the Like, just go with the of the apes. We're not like. I don't, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know. Like, I just, I, I look at this. I see graphic design logo nightmare. I don't know how they do it, but whatever. It's. Fine. I'm sure it'll be uh, retitled. I'm sure. I mean, it's a couple years away. They'll, they'll come up with something. I don't think Andy Circus is confirmed to be in this, right? I no, I don't think so. Did he put the previous <laughs> films on his back? Because I heard Absolutely. he's kind of Absolutely. the big thing to watch in those movies. So, uh, I, I mean, know. not to slander the man, but. Uh, <laughs> He's probably a little old and still wanted to be do motion capture. There's a lot of it's very physically demanding kind of acting right. work. Um, yeah. and he, he's more in the director's chair now, which um, probably he enjoys more. Sure. Uh, we did also see him and Matt Reeves, the Batman, very briefly. He was on set for four days. <laughs> he was, sure. plays Alfred the Butler. He's barely in the movie, but he kind of has an important bit. Like he, he, he is important to the plot, at least in one point. Anyway, uh, I am not too hot on New Planet of the Apes. These movies make a billion dollars, so don't listen to me. If you like Planet of the Apes, good news. There's another one coming. Keep it here on Oscar for more. Our right, last story this week. It was a rough week at the box office. A rough month at the box office, actually. Uh, finding that the box office has endured its worst September in 26 years. 
excluding last year because last year's COVID and, and everything was bad. Uh, not too exciting, I don't think, Andy. People wanted to see better numbers at the box office. Right. Well, after a really promising summer, we knew that there was a drought coming, and it's it's as bad, if not worse, than than we thought. After you know, big tent poles like Top Gun Maverick, Thor: Love and Thunder, Minions: Rise of Gru. <laughs> after all those, there was nothing really for August and September, particularly now that. And there's also things like schools starting back. You know, kids got to go back to school, parents got to go back to work, and all those things like that factors in some. But there were just no new big tentpole releases as well. Last year, we had uh, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings uh, to kind of help us through that month. But there, the big release was essentially Don't Worry, Darling, and it's done okay. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty bad for September. But And this has been part of the, the pandemic uh, you know, production shortage, supply chain shortage. Yeah, I don't think anybody who's been watching too closely is surprised by this um you're absolutely right it's a matter of like what was made during the pandemic um the films that were being made currently in production like when the pandemic happened have already come out and the movies that were just getting off the ground after the pandemic was kind of rounding and hollywood was figuring out their rules for face masks and social distancing on set those movies just got pushed to all summer and any others that haven't come out yet either went straight to streaming or are being saved for oscar season we are traditionally in a time of a bit of drought at the movies all the good summer movies come out we got to wait for all the award-winning stuff so september is always a little slow but this is like a perfect storm of not a lot happening uh it's not all bad though we've seen some good films in september we both really like pearl i don't remember if barbarian was in september but it was yes, out it then. Was. Uh, yeah and if you haven't seen it yet i'm sure top gun maverick is still in theaters so you can <laughs> yeah. go see that good lord uh go, going on its 20th week uh it'll it'll be there when your kids are, are going to the movies um I don't know. I, I, you know, it wasn't so bad. It, it does bum me out, though, because it seemed like we were having a really good run through the summer. Yeah, it, it looks like 2023 September will have so, some tent poles, and they're learning th that basically you can release any of these superhero movies kind of whenever. So if you release something in September, it's probably going to make a lot of money, especially since it's not going to have uh, competition at all but coming up in october we have a lot of good releases we have uh halloween ends coming up in a couple of weeks black adam so at least two big uh tent poles for this month speaking of poor september numbers uh do you want to talk about why bros underperformed here or should we wait till before we do the review because i don't mind waiting that'll be in like 20 what, minutes or so wh why don't we wait <laughs> Okay, why why don't we wait? Good idea. Uh, we'll get into that right before our review towards the end of the show. But first, when you get to our big review this week, uh, this is a movie that came out a couple weeks ago. And last week, I was out of town and couldn't talk about it. But we saw it. We're excited to get into it. Andy, you uh, want to take it away? Don't worry, darling. So this is the sophomore follow-up from director Olivia Wilde, who, of course, did Booksmart back in 2019. Uh, to Ray Reviews, it's a really great film, great comedy. Uh, this movie stars Florence Pugh as Alice, uh, who lives in this idyllic 1950s community called Victory uh, with her husband, played by Harry Styles. They have a very loving and intense relationship. And this is a kind of community where the, the women stay home and, go, you know, get their nails done, cook, clean, go to dance class together. And then the men go off to mysteriously work on something the victory project we don't know what it is we know there's some weird things happening like earthquakes and so it kind of gives you the idea maybe they're working on some sort of weapons maybe something nuclear something like that we don't really know but weird things begin to happen in victory uh alice begins to kind of see things that maybe aren't there she sees this weird kind of mirage in the distance a plane in the sky there's uh, things in her house that are strange. Uh, you know, she cracks an egg open that has no yolk in it, and it's just kind of full of air. And something's not quite right. We get the the uh, the feeling that uh, there's some sort of seek or something is going on. Someone else is pulling the strings. Uh, Chris Pine is also in this as the kind of leader of all that that's happening here. That's our setup. I can't really say too much more without uh, getting into spoilers. So uh, that's what I'll say. I'll, I'll say that some of this, a lot of things work in this movie. Some things don't, uh, but we're going to have a lot to talk about. Zach, what do you think? 
Uh, Don't Worry Darling had a lot of discourse around it regarding its press tour uh, before it came out. Uh, There were some reports of Harry Styles spitting on Chris Pine. Uh, uh, Florence Pugh infamously was not going to speak about the film at all. Uh, Olivia Wilde had a whole thing with Shia LaBeouf, who was previously cast in Harry Styles' role. A couple actors said that they had large parts of their scenes cut from the entire film as things were moved around in editing. Uh, There's a lot going on with with the press around don't worry darling and and regardless of all of it i was excited to see it and annie was excited to see it because we both went and saw book smart olivia wilde's previous film uh came out just a few years ago it's a comedy uh and book smart was so good book smart was so good dude book smart's a sleeper if you haven't seen it you still still should go see book smart really funny really sharp and we thought, okay, this is Livy Wilde's second big film. She's going to go bigger. And in a lot of ways, Don't Worry Darling does go bigger and does go bolder. But it suffers some kind of structural problems that I think mostly come from the script and the editing room that I think really drag it down. And it's a shame because uh, there's a lot of smart stuff happening in this movie. Um I was just okay with it. Don't worry, darling's okay. And and it's a shame because like I really wanted it to be cool. So let's jump into it. Um, what's the best place to get started here? Well, let's start with the positives. Uh, so there are a lot of things that are done really well. The script is is the biggest problem. We can get into that. But the um, like the performances are really strong. Florence Pugh pretty much carries this whole entire movie on her whole back. Not of any fault of her own, not, not because of other people are bad, but because she is the main character and she's kind of in every scene. There's not really things with scenes with other people, uh, but, but her performance is really solid as this uh, person who is kind of accepting her surroundings, but then eventually begins to question everything about it. It's a little bit, bit matrixy, like, you know, what, what is, what is this world I'm, I'm in? And uh, she's, re- she's really good. Chris Pine is, is also does a good job. He's, he's the big, you know, he's the villain, but he's, he's kind of undersold. He does not really given enough scenes to, to really shine. Um, Harry Styles does. Okay. I mean, he was kind of the big, another big name. Cause he's, you know, a fame known as a famous musical artist. Um, he's, he's fine. Some people said he's, he's really bad or he's got an, I thought he was just fine. He, like, yeah, whatever. He fits. He fits the bill. He's got a couple of good yelling scenes that, that work. Um, it's fine. Olivia Wilde. There's a handful of other characters like Olivia Wilde and Gemma Chan who are fine, but they just don't get enough screen time, uh, which is just kind of uh, of another issue. But the performances, I think, are one of the stronger parts of the of the movie. Yeah. Uh, additionally, the setting I think is a really strong part of Don't Worry, Darling. Uh, Victory is this obscure yeah idyllic 50s like community out in the desert and you never really get an idea of where that desert is it's just kind of this abstract space where just outside the confines of these wonderful little like you know houses that have popped up this big community pool in the middle nice roads and uh old 50s cars and hot rods and 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 guys and gals walking around in dresses and, and suits and ties wearing their watches uh it's just kind of desert and and, and some kind of mountains like a mountain ridge and you don't really know what's past there it's part of the mystery of the film right what's what's going on here why are we out here and our characters find out very quickly or we find out through them that uh everything's perfect in victory right like you don't the, the, the housewives don't have to work uh they just kind of cook and clean and go shopping during the day and drink cosmos by the pool unlimited cosmos unlimited pool time uh their their husband's make a great paycheck and are happy the only thing is you can't ask what's going on you can't you can't ask what the guys do for work and when you do they can't tell you and if you go looking you'll get in trouble that's 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 the whole idea that through uniformity secrecy is possible and through secrecy success happens but we don't know what success is and it's really cool to see florence Pugh like really really take the role and run with it and turn it all the way to 11 as Alice, this this woman who really likes her life and really loves her husband and like, doesn't want things to change, but has a friend who starts experiencing some really odd sensations and starts doing weird things. And she starts to kind of chase down that to find out what's wrong with her friend played by Kiki Lane. Uh, And that's when it starts to get weird. <laughs> That's when we start to see some strange things, uh, some visions, some surprisingly good horror imagery with dancers and face paint and, and 
some decent stuff in there. Like I, I some some well shot, well thought out montages. Um, the problem is, I think it falls a lot into uh, the same ruts that a lot of these other like fifties utopia dystopian films fall into. Right? You're gonna look at movies like The Truman Show or De- The Stepford Wives or uh, uh, Pleasantville. We watched Greener Grass just a couple years ago. Andy mentioned The Matrix, even um the 13th the floor twilight zone yeah the 13th floor right like you start to check off in your head like you've kind of seen the first couple acts of this movie before and really what you're waiting for is to find out what what's it all mean what what's what's chris what's the big secret yeah what what's the thing and we can't we won't talk about that on this show uh but it, it does it does set up the film to be a bit of a house of cards right like it's all building to the mystery and uh that 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 it sets a lofty goal, I think, that I'm not sure it quite hits uh, emotionally. Yeah, th- this is where the the problems start to kind of rear their head uh, with the script. Is, is that there's a lot of weird things that happen in in Victory, and it never all really ties together. And that's just kind of th- the main issue with the film in general. Is there's lots of little neat ideas or like l- short scenes that work really well but it just doesn't all connect together and it it's ends up being less than the some of its parts i i mean when 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 you eventually learn like what's actually going on it's kind of underwhelming uh it's also it's also like you probably guessed it along the way um or guessed a, a variation of it um i saw, one of the reviews i saw was like you know it, it's going to be one of five things just pick it just pick you'll probably be close um it, yeah, like all, all the weirdness, like this weird plane she sees in 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 the sky. The uh, there's a scene in the trailer where like she's getting pressed between wall the, these glass walls. The the eggs being empty. Um, none of it really ties together. There's a lot. Of, there's a thing with all the women take this ballet class, um, which is like this weird. I think it's supposed to be like a form of control, but it um, again it never really ties together in the end. It, it's very black swanish, and like the scenes themselves work on their own that they just don't tie together. And that's th- just the main problem is that it, it just doesn't tie together like a coherent movie by the end of it. Yeah. It's got a funny problem where it seems to just have like a genuine lack of tension. Like you're never really concerned for our characters. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like I, I definitely want to know what's what's wrong with Alice, right. And, and figure out what it is and why your husband, Jack doesn't seem to think anything's wrong and everybody seems to be going along with their lives. But like, just sitting in your seat, you're never really concerned. Andy compared it to the same problem I had with old, which is probably fair. We know from the trailer, not all is right in victory, right? We know from the trailer, something's really wrong. So when it takes 45 minutes for our characters to figure out not all is right in victory, what are we as the audience doing for that 45 minutes? Eating our popcorn, waiting? Like, and, and that, that, it's not... I don't know. I don't quite land it with old because old is just on a damn beach. At least this had some uh, eye candy to look at, right? At least you have like cool sets, cool dresses. Chris Pine is this really mysterious kind of uh, Walt Disney kind of character, uh, at least at least for a little while. Like big, bold vision and the, the husbands aren't talking about what's going on. Like all that stuff works, but like it just never, it never put me on the edge of my seat. Like ever i think maybe one scene like i was kind of like hmm what like sit forward like what's going on here but the rest of it you're just sitting back watching a popcorn flick and i i think it it should have been more i i I don't i don't know how you tie that together i guess it's a question for yeah there's a lot again it's all in the writing it's all in the script and i heard that this script had a lot of problems whenever it was bought and that it went through a lot of rewrites to try and fix it and apparently needed a few more drafts because there's a lot of different ways you could go. You know, is it, is it like some sort of uh, you know, or is it like a Truman show situation? If it is, then you need to kind of know you're in the situation sooner. If it's, you know, a number of other things, it just, it could go in uh, several different ways and it tries to go in all of them at the same time. And it just doesn't, uh, it doesn't really work. You're not really again, worried for the, any of our characters, um, someone has pointed out that it seems to be, you know, try to be about like control and controlling women and um, women not having autonomy and things like that. And someone pointed out like, well, we 
kind of already live in a society like that. That's not, this isn't like some sort of like crazy sci-fi experiment where women don't or don't have control over themselves. Like um, it's actually very scary, like scarily accurate to to the real world. So so it kind of is undermined by that. Yeah, I I, I can't speak towards some of its larger themes. I mean, uh, Olivia Wilde was saying things during early interviews of this film like you know only only women orgasm in this movie <laughs> like not 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 men and you're like what what does that have to do with anything and then you watch the movie and you're like that doesn't help any why would you even say that just generate a headline like it just seems like a whole lot of confusing discourse around what don't worry darling is supposed to be i mean even the trailers like the teaser trailer for this movie plays like something's kind of wrong maybe it's like a sci-fi horror thing but ultimately it kind of turns around and becomes this Maybe story of of triumph of this woman overcoming this mystery and finding out the bigger picture. And then the second trailer is like it's a weird horror movie, like and it plays really like dark and ends the trailer on a big like dom like it's I don't know and and is weird press around it and it's it's really a shame because I think the movie turns out to be less than the sum of its parts. It thinks it's more clever than it is, and I I think it needed a red pen. It needed a bit more work on the script before they turned out whatever they got. And, and that's not to speak towards scenes that were reportedly cut from the film. Every movie has scenes cut in editing, but uh, to hear a couple of these actors tell it, like they had large parts of the film cut out. And when you watch it, that might add up because there's some clues. There's straight red herrings that don't lead to anything, and that's that doesn't feel right. That that feels incorrect, out of place in a movie where you're already supposed to feel a little out of place, I guess. I don't know if I have any other thoughts on this. Uh, anything else before recommendations? I think I'm ready. Andy, would you recommend Don't Worry, Darling? I would say save it for streaming, uh, unless you're like a diehard fan, really want to get out there and see what it's all, all about. There are some redeeming qualities, like the, the performances are strong, the setting is, is interesting. Um, it's just kind of a mess, and that's why it, it in the end it, it kind of falls short. So, uh, like I said, save it for streaming. I'm surprised there was so much buzz and so much scandal about it because I was like, for, for all, all of that, it, it was kind of underwhelming. Yeah, I, I'm kind of in the same boat. I, I like the I like the idea of the spectacle of Don't Worry Darling, but then you actually get in there and watch it. You're like, okay, this isn't quite as big and bold as I think I had hoped. I think it was, yeah, overplayed in the marketing. Like they, they went a little too far, especially with the press tour stuff. Like, my God, did people get excited about this movie? Um, and I think that's not good. If anything, like part of the reason I think Booksmart impressed me so much is because I thought Booksmart was going to be, I don't know, less than it was. I thought Booksmart was going to be this small, tiny indie feature that was just a super bad clone with girls. And I was like, okay, well, that'll be fine, I guess. And it came out, and it was so much more than that. This is the exact opposite. Like, I thought it was going to be more, and it turns out it's a lot less. And that's a shame. Save for streaming. Uh, Florence Pugh puts the whole freaking movie on her back. If you like Florence Pugh, you're probably going to like Don't Worry Darling. She's really good in it. Like, she really elevates it. Um, that's don't worry darling uh and with that we should move on to our next segment uh talk about a couple exciting trailers coming up soon Andy, you want to kick this one off for us it's time for the trailer park so today we're going to be covering just a couple of trailers uh this one uh just came out earlier uh this or actually i think in the middle of last week called bones and all and this is the follow-up from luca guadagnino who did uh suspiria and uh, call me by, by your name. Uh, this stars Timothy Chalamet and uh, newcomer Camille DeAngelis. Oh no, that, that's sorry, Taylor Russell. Uh, this is based on a novel by Camille DeAngelis, and uh, I'm not real sure what this was about. But I th like a teaser came out, and uh, it it looks like a love story of some sort. Like, but kind of uh, looks like homeless people on the road, basically. Uh, it was Timothy Chalamet and uh, Taylor Russell. Uh, playing the, this couple, uh, but there's a lot of kind of bloody scenes. It hints at it kind of more. And then I saw a different cut of this trailer uh, in that. That's very kind of scary. And this is a, uh, I'm just going to sum it up. It's a cannibal love story where both Timothy Chalamet and his, his partner, uh, Taylor Russell, both kind of have, uh, they're like vampires, but they, they have a need to eat people. They want to eat people. And uh, it seems like there's others like them out there and they're trying to just kind of get through the world and survive in this uh, kind of weird horror romance. Uh, uh, this looks pretty rad. I'm all in on this movie. 
Yeah. Uh, Bones and All looks like some bold cinema. Uh, it looks like maybe an approachable film for general audiences for Luca Guadagnino, if you can get past the um, likely horror elements. Uh, the last movie we watched from him was the Suspiria remake. And that movie pulls very few punches. The Suspiria remakes hardcore. Like there's, there's some really, really gore, gory stuff in that. And I have no doubt that this movie will likely aspire to the same uh, sick convulsions. Uh, I think Bones and All looks cool. Sh- Timothy Chalamet looks like he's lighting it up. And and regardless of what you think of the kid, he's got talent. So I think if the newcomers are good, I think if it comes together, we might just have a good movie on our hands. Uh, with that, we should talk about our second trailer. Final one before we get to our bros review. Uh, this is the trailer for The Wonder. And The Wonder is a Netflix film from Sebastian uh, Lelio, Lelio um, uh, who yeah, is he's... telling the story. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, Sebastian Lelio, you, you'll you notice, you we've watched a couple of his films already. He, uh, he won an Oscar for A Fantastic Woman uh, a couple of years ago. He did um, Disobedience in 2017. It was an honorable mention for me. I love that movie. Yeah, disobedience. That's yeah, what I was bring it up. Dis- Go ahead. Disobedience is great. Anyway, uh, the wonder is the story of a young woman who uh, I don't know when this takes place in Ireland. I, I couldn't even tell you. Uh, so, yeah. Looks like the early, yeah, late late eighteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds. Uh, who's out out in the out in the in the, the Highlands? Who is given to, to given a task? She has to take care of a young girl who is fasting and has not eaten in four months. Uh, some think it is divine intervention and she's eating uh, the manna of the heavens of God. Other think she is some kind of weird freak. Some think she's faking it. Other think others think people are faking it for her. And Florence Pugh, our lead, uh, from Don't Worry Darling, is given the task of taking care of her and maybe even finding out what's going on it's being touted as a psychological thriller a story of love pitted against evil a tale of two strangers transforming each other's lives and it's coming to netflix on november 16th andy what do you think of the wonder um i'm pretty into this movie as well it, it reminded me a lot of the witch uh that kind of folk horror you know pe- people way out in times w- long before electricity and the internet uh the, those sorts of things and it and a little bit of the exorcist because there, there's a girl who is something's wrong with her you know she's not eaten in four months but somehow still alive uh something's clearly not right with the situation uh not a priest but, but a woman a woman and a, a, a second character who's a nun are both supposed to kind of observe this girl and see what happens and yeah the trailer looks really in intense and don't really know what much about it i don't want to see any more I don't want to like, uh, you know, see another trailer or anything. Like, I'm definitely way into it. I'm definitely really excited about it. And you know, Florence Pugh continues to deliver. Yeah, she sure does. I, I, I at this point, I have no doubt Florence Pugh will turn out a stellar performance. And with that, we should jump into our final review of the episode. Uh, when you talk about bros, we do need to talk so about bros. bros is the story of Bobby, a young, uh, gay, uh, cis white male podcaster and museum curator at the new uh, LGBTQIA plus museum in New York City. He is in his 40s and perpetually lonely. Is not a relationship guy, and he is, of course, gay. And uh, Bobby meets one night at a party uh, this interesting uh, hunk of a man named Aaron, played by Luke McFarlane. And uh, the two have made it off, even though both of them have some pretty clear commitment problems. And over the next two hours, uh, Bobby and Aaron might just stick together, or things might just fall apart. It is a gay love story. Uh, from Universal, cost $22 million, the most expensive uh, mainstream gay love story ever put to film. And I'm excited to talk about bros. Andy, what'd you think? Uh, I really enjoyed this. It's as a, It works on a lot of levels. As a comedy, it's very, very funny. I laughed a lot. And there weren't a lot of people in my theaters. It was one of those, you know, because sometimes if, you, if you're in a big theater, a little bit of laughter will go a long way. But when you're by yourself, it's not quite the same but there are a, a ton of laughs a ton of good jokes it is very authentic to gay people and gay culture and the lgbtq community in general part of what surprised me about this is you know i just thought it was going to be a rom-com with two men and 
uh, it's so much more than that because uh, Bobby is also a he's an ambassador of of the of the community, and that's part of his his work at uh, the LGBTQ museum is part of that. But it's also he sprinkles that in throughout the whole movie. You know, he talks about you know gay people were only on screen if they were being abused or or beaten, and they were played by a straight man. Um, you know, brings up things like Brokeback Mountain and other films like that. So he he's sp- educating the audience on kind of the the trials and tribulations of the gay community over the last in entertainment over the last 30 40 50 years and that's what i I didn't really uh expect and i think is also really important because it it easily could have like swept a lot of that uh under the rug so it's it's very important in in that sense and and it works as a rom-com it's it's hilarious like I, i laughed a ton uh through this yeah, uh, the movie's written by Billy Eichner and director Nicholas Stoller. Uh, director Nicholas Stoller formerly did films like, I did the Muppet movie, am I crazy? Now he, he produced the Muppet movie. Uh, Neighbors, Neighbors 2, Get Him to the Greek, Forgetting Sarah Marshall, that's not a small film, uh, Storks most recently, the animated film. Uh, and Billy Eichner really leans in on the pride in this movie, which he should, because I think he knows exactly the kind of movie he's writing. Uh, it opens with him explaining <laughs> a lot of uh, very quick, very quick, very very quick conversation to his podcast audience. Uh, as was one man podcast, does it by himself. Uh, how appropriate! Uh, explaining that he is, yeah, an ambassador to the community, and he's going to act like it. And the movie is loud and proud and presents that way. It's a lot of very fast, rapid fire jokes. Uh, there was a couple of folks in my uh, theater who were. Uh, very, very, very loudly gay, and they were laughing their freaking heads off at this movie, which helped other people laugh, which got everybody going. I think probably the best way to see this movie was with a lot of folks, but I'm past that now and saw it with as many as I could, I guess. Uh, the point is, it feels like Eichner knew when he was putting this movie together, hey, uh, this is going to be a big gay movie in theaters. We should act like it, and we should present that and we should represent that his character also does that through uh his activism yeah being a museum curator at the lgbtq plus museum uh he's put in a lot of scenes with a handful of other museum curators you'll see him in the trailer uh dot marie jones jim rash miss lawrence uh they will debate uh what should go in this museum to represent gay culture right and represent lesbians and rep- rep- represent bi and, and represent everybody and it's it's funny because like you get a lot of really hot takes on the culture, like, but from the comfort of your movie theater seat, eating your popcorn. It's funny, like it's it's a very funny movie. Like I had a lot of laughs, I think, uh, and that's not even getting into like the actual relationship between uh, Bobby and Aaron. Right. That that's what I was going to move on to next. So, uh, Bobby me- meets Aaron at this. Uh, it's some sort of dance club. And uh, Aaron's kind of the exact opposite of him. He's, he's very, Aaron is very like buff and confident. And like, you know, is, he meets him in this club with, without a shirt on. And Bobby's kind of the other. He's very thin. He's kind of frail. Um, and th- they don't really hit it off initially. He's kind of, they're kind of rude to each other and kind of give attitude. But eventually the, they end up um, exchanging numbers and talking a little bit and, and actually kind of hanging out. But you, you get a, a kind of taste of gay culture along the way because they're they're while they're talking with each other they're still kind of hooking up with other people they're going to like crazy parties you know it, it it's a very kind of almost non-monogamous uh, situation but it eventually they become closer and closer and become dedicated to each other but then they all that also brings up issues of you know their families uh how did that the, the kind of things that come up in normal rom-coms, you know, what are your friends going to think? What are your family's going to think? You know, what are you coming home for the holidays? You know, all, all those kinds of issues. And they are different people. Like you said, Bobby is very much this ambassador and he wants to, if there's a moment to, you know, educate people on the, the, on LGBTQ things, he's going to do it, especially for someone who's ignorant. And there are, uh, uh, times like, like that and meanwhile aaron kind of has this he he's a, a state lawyer and it's kind of unhappy with with his work and so he's trying to maybe find a way out of that so it has you know those kind of ster- stereotypical rom-com uh things to, to go through but it does them very well 
Yeah, if anything, I think one of the weaker points of the film is its kind of rom-com trappings. Because at two hours, it starts to feel a little long. Um, I had a horrible mistake in this movie. I, I had to get up and go to the bathroom. And I'm walking to the bathroom, and I'm thinking, we're, we're, we're taking the turn to the third act here, surely. Uh, at some point, these two are going to get in a fight. It's not, you know, they're going to, I don't know if it's going to work out. And then one of them's going to run up to the other one on the street and be like, I love you. I'm crazy about you. That one's going to be like, me too. And then the credits are going to roll rom-com, right? And I get up and I walk to the bathroom and like, I check my phone and I'm like, maybe halfway through. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> oh dear like what what do you mean i'm halfway through this movie where where's the next hour supposed to go and i think the problem i had with this movie is it's a good feels like a really good gay movie and it feels like a really big theatrical film it's just not a very good rom-com uh i think the things that work about it are billy and aaron's or bobby and aaron's uh like expressions towards each other as very very different men uh bobby has been told his whole life to be quiet and be less right which translates to don't you know don't don't be so gay uh and luke meanwhile or aaron i should say played by luke mcfarlane uh has been kind of quiet and kept to himself and is not really presenting as as particularly queer and i think that's a good dichotomy for their characters uh and it gives bob the opportunity to kind of grow outside of himself and see the world in a different way and it helps aaron grow to be more confident in the person that he really is uh which is good stuff um that stuff i think is effective especially this really great scene where bobby's explaining that like back when he was a kid yeah people told him to to keep to himself and don't you know don't don't be so gay and, and people aren't gonna like that um that's just really heartfelt and like really sincere the problem is it's just a whole lot of will they won't they for a long time <laughs> It's like, okay, it gets, it gets the goods. Like we, 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 we know how rom-coms go, but that's, that's, I think a trapping of me. I've said just, you know, I'm not the biggest, clearly not the biggest rom-com guy. Uh, so personal hot take felt a little long. I didn't know if you felt the same way, Andy. I, I felt just a little bit. Yeah. I wanted it to kind of get moving. Uh, luckily, like it, it is pretty funny. Most of the jokes land. I mean, it's like 90% of them land. It, it's a really good ratio um so you're kind of laughing all the way through so you, you don't mind quite as much yeah it, it could be a stronger rom-com for sure like i said it's very much occupied with, with being um like i said a movie that is educating its audience on the struggle of the lgbtq community and that's almost the the, the kind of prime directive and the uh the rom-com kind of takes a second seat and, and that could have been written out stronger i agree now that I think is the perfect time really quick before we get to final reviews to talk about the marketing for this movie. Uh, bros has underperformed at the box office. It was speculated to make about eight to $10 million opening weekend. It made about four and a half, not quite a box office bomb, but on a budget of 22 million, not doing great. Uh, and there's a few reasons for this. And I'm looking forward to talking about this, uh, cause Andy and I are a little out of our depth, but, uh, I do want to talk about why bros is underperformed because it's not a bad movie. I don't think uh, I have some theories and you want me to open this up and you can riff on what I say, or do you want to just uh, you yeah, go ahead. Get out of the gate? And, yeah. Okay. Uh, there's a couple of reasons. I think bros is underperforming. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to act like one of them isn't because of, you know, homophobia. It is. There's definitely a portion of audiences that are not going to go see this movie. This movie's not going to run in the middle East. China's not going to run bros. Like, so that's going to hurt it. Uh, number two, um, <laughs> the marketing for this movie is a little questionable. I, I haven't seen a lot of ads for it. I think the stuff we did see, we were excited. I remember when the trailer first came out, we covered it on the trailer park here on the show. Andy and I both said we wanted to see it. Uh, but since then, they haven't done a whole lot. They've kind of run the same trailer. And what I've mostly seen is Billy Eichner doing his Billy on the Street gag uh, on TikTok advertising the movie. And Billy Eichner is... The, the head the lead guy in this and he's definitely playing like a softer more sentimental version of what i think people have expected to see from him which is the guy from parks and rec which is the guy from billy on the street who's really abrasive and loud <laughs> and will shout people down um that's part of the whole gag of billy on the street so using that character to advertise this feels like a mistake and additionally, uh, I think there's some political trappings around telling people that if they are not homophobes, they'll go see bros and saying things like not enough straight people turned out 
and it's the straight's fault that bros is underperforming like that doesn't help that that drives people who are already on the fence away uh i i'm glad i went and saw it and i want to encourage people to go see it too it bums me out that it's not doing better and i think those are some reasons that it's not doing as well as you'd think also one more thing uh billy's Billy Eichner's co-star, Luke McFarlane, is not known for a lot. Uh, he's mostly known for Hallmark, Hallmark movies, movies, yeah, which is funny because those are riffed on a lot in this movie, uh, and I think is actually adds to adds a layer to it. Doesn't take anything away. Um, people don't really know him, and the only real star I think people have seen in this is Billy Eichner, and he's a little divisive. People either like him or they don't. Yeah, um, I've seen some of this. The Billy Eichner's reaction is not definitely not helping the movie. No. Um, I, from what I've talked, a lot of people just didn't know this, so it's a marketing thing. Uh, probably wasn't marketed as heavily as it it could have been. And sometimes, also the the, the comedy genre is just a weak genre at the theater now. It, people just don't go out to them. You know, they're going to watch a comedy at home, um, and that's just the way. It, you know, that's just the way it is now. And so there's a lot going against the movie. It's it's a weird time of the year um comedies don't do well don't do well <laughs> it came out next well rom-coms certainly don't uh those are those are underperforming across the board uh say for like lost city of d uh it came out next to smile which heard it i saw a lot of people on reddit talking about it and they were like i went to the theater with my friends it was smile or bros what do you think we went and saw like the the, the weird jump scare horror right or like the two-hour rom-com like I, I kind I kind of get it. It bums me out though. I, I still wish it had done better, and I hope it sees returns on streaming, which seems promising. I, I saw a lot of people saying, "Yeah, I want." I like if this was on Netflix, I'd have watched it. Right? Like this would this would be an easy one to jump to. But I like that it aspires to be bigger. I like that it it, it wants to be more, and it knows that. The problem is, I think that gets in the way of it being a good romantic comedy, <laughs> uh, as good as those parts are. Um. So yeah. Any other thoughts for recommendations, Andy? I think I'm ready. Andy, uh, would you recommend Bros? I would. It, I had a really good time. It's really funny. It's a really sweet uh, rom-com. It is, you know, again, very educational to those both within and outside of the LGBTQ community. Like you, you and I, uh, um, and I, I had a great great time in it it's unfortunate that it's not finding an audience if you're a little unsure of it definitely uh we'll wait till it hits a streaming service um because it will be a good time then definitely works well in a crowd uh i think um i i there were literally four people in my theater so uh i wish it'd been been a little bit bigger uh yeah i'm mostly in the same boat i like bros and i think it's cool and if you are interested you should go see it while it's in theaters it's not particularly cinematic but there's something about it it, it feels special um while you're sitting there watching it it feels like you're watching something you know that's been taboo and you feels like you're watching something different and and a different spin on what would otherwise be you know, a pretty standard two hour rom-com. Like there's, there's something happening in bros. And I don't know if that will mean something for it down the road. I don't know if people will look back and say this was a trailblazer. I don't know if people will look back and say it was a dud. I, I'm not sure, but I'm glad I saw it in theaters and I don't think it'll have the same. It just won't have the same je ne sais quoi when it shows up on Netflix and is like on the banner for a week and then gets lost behind the next piece of content so if you have the means go see bros I, I think bros is good stuff I really do if you're interested uh, I, I, you don't really have to worry about content warnings I mean obviously you're going to see some boys doing boy stuff but it's not porn I mean you're not going to see anything like radically hardcore so go see bros I, I think it's a good time it's funny you're going to get more than a few laughs out of it past the six laugh test solid comedy I like bros and with that being said, uh, I think we're just about at the end of the show. A uh, quick one this week, Andy. What are we watching next week? So a couple of big releases. Uh, Amsterdam, the David O. Russell uh, new film starring Christian Bale, Margot Robbie, John David Washington. That comes out in theaters only October 7th. And then uh, the other one is the Hellraiser, is, or just Hellraiser. Yeah. Uh, which is the remake, which will be coming out on Hulu on this Friday, October. October 7th. Um, so th those will be the two two big ones. I also wanted to mention that um, Blonde is now out on Netflix, the Marilyn Monroe uh, biopic thing uh, starring uh, Anna Darmus in the titular role. Uh, that's been getting kind of weird re reviews. Uh, it's not being reviewed 
positively and it is super long it's like two hours 45 minutes um i'm not interested in watching it at this point because of just if it's as bad as people say it is i don't want to sit through three hours of it but that is out on netflix if you're interested in, in watching uh very excited about hellraiser it's october we're in spook season baby give me give me that hellraiser it's gonna be good stuff uh amsterdam i don't know i've heard some earlier reviews that are real bad people are saying it's a real bad movie and i don't love the, the old david o russell connection but tell you what if we go see it and it's terrible we'll let you know and you won't spend the money on a ticket and ultimately that's good for everybody and uh as for blonde kind of the same thing i really wanted to watch that movie i've heard people saying it is cruel it is a cruel representation of Marilyn Monroe. Like, good Lord. I can't remember the last time somebody said a movie was cruel. Uh, and that's that's not awesome. I know it's based on a book about her life. It's closer to fan fiction than it is biography. We're probably not going to end up watching Blonde. Maybe we have a slow week in a few weeks. But we're getting into Halloween season. We're getting into awards season. All right. There's some good things coming at the movies. And if you want to keep up with all of it, the best way to do it is just subscribe to the podcast. Subscribe to your boys at Off Script Film Review to get new episodes delivered straight to you every single week when we do them on Tuesdays. We live stream our show on Facebook. We're actually live streaming right now. If you watch it, zero viewers. Nobody's watching. But if somebody were watching, <laughs> <laughs> they'd see us right now on Facebook. Uh, we have our archive on YouTube where we upload all our live streams shortly after the fact. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. You can like. You can follow. You can comment. You can rate and review if you want. And we're on all the usual audio platforms, of course. iTunes, Google, Spotify, iHeartMedia. All the usual places. You boys are off script there. But if there's anything you want to do to help us out, just subscribe. And uh, let us know in the comments or the ratings or reviews with a, a five stars, of course, how great we're doing and how much you like the show. With that, uh, I think that wraps. God, episode 191. Andy, we're coming up on 200. We're going to have to do something better. I, I know. We got to think, think of it. <laughs> Start Gee, planning. I can't believe it. I know. Good Lord. Uh, from all of us at Oscar, the home of Bolt Cinema, I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. Thanks for watching.